How's it going? Hello, Kat. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Hi, guys. Hey, it's gonna say. Are we gonna? <laughs> and we have Josh just buds in. He doesn't yeah. let us introduce himself. <laughs> so we are joined. You guys will probably recognize his voice. We just did a live stream and some photography Q and A, and he was on with our Mata interview a couple of weeks ago. Um, but Josh, who is at Seven Watches on Instagram? Yeah. Hi, guys. I, I actually. The Manta thing seems so far away. It, well, really, so it was ago. like three months ago, but it didn't yeah. debut until, well, I guess it's February, yeah. right? All yeah, right. It was the first of January that it came out. Oh, yeah. man. So long ago. Too much stuff has gone by. But yeah. we're back all together again. Yeah. We are back. The three Glad to be back. Friends. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thank me, you guys. for being here. Yeah, I think this episode I've kind of had in the back of my mind for a while because I know me and Catelyn both get a ton of photography questions. I'm sure you do all the time as well. And a lot of people want to know, like, what's the best gear? What's the best camera? And the truth is, like, it's hard for me to say because I don't know what people's budgets are and everyone yeah. has a different setup. But, uh, yeah, definitely wanted to get you on the show here and uh, chat about some of that stuff. Absolutely. I'm happy to help. It's yeah. That what's the best camera is, is <laughs> you might as well say what's the best watch. Exactly. You know, it's it's they, There are a lot of overlap between the two yeah. hobbies and a lot of integration. Yeah, exactly. And you've, you've taught both of us. I mean, my level of photography has definitely gone up since working with you for like half a day. Yeah. So I, I learned a lot. <laughs> so I think uh, a lot of people can, can take some notes from this podcast today. I agree for sure. Before so. we get into it though, oh, we yeah. should do a response We chat. should. Because I think everybody on the Instagram live wanted to know about your Grand Seiko. Oh, I wish it was wrist. mine. Oh, right. It's not mine. It's on borrow. But um, I'm wearing the SB GM221, which is the Grand Seiko Automatic GMT. It's a damn fine watch. It really like, is. It, that is like, a great way to put it. <laughs> it is just a damn fine watch. <laughs> It's perfect. It I, is. The size is really, really good. We're both yeah. crushing on Grand Seiko so hard right now. Yeah. And I think, like, because I really want a GMT. Um, but this is the cream color dial. But you said there's a black dial, too. No, there's a there's a more, oh. a more white dial. Okay. And then there's a, like, limited edition dial that has some texture and some writing on it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there's a couple different variations of it's it. So I'm so going to lay that right there in the, in the middle so yeah. that we... <laughs> This podcast is over. We're just going to sit here and stare yeah. at this watch because you see it's right under some lighting. So you just see like all of the, the finishing and how the light plays with it. Yeah. I was actually like, I was wowed when I opened up the watch. I, it is. I mean, I've wild. been obsessed with pictures of it online mm -hmm. for a very long time, but seeing it in person, it, it's totally different. Yeah. Kat, you and I were talking and, and we have a, a local AD here that has Grand Seiko as of like the last year or so. Mm -hmm. And I went in and looked at a lot of different pieces and it's amazing that out of all the pieces that they had, this to me was the standout Grand Seiko yeah. in the case. Like there's just <laughs> something about the, the finishing and faceting on the indices and the mm -hmm. mix of the GMT complication with like what could be considered to be a slightly more dressy case. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's not quite as angular as a lot of Grand Seikos. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a very uh, easily digestible Grand Seiko for mm -hmm. some that might struggle with like the the chunkier, thicker cases. Yeah, and it's it's gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people steer away from this model because it doesn't have that Grand Seiko um, angular finishing that a lot of the other ones do, and it's not it's not a nine F quartz. It's not a spring drive. It's just an automatic. Now it's a it's a great automatic, and the the finishing on the movement in the back is really nice as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think uh, it, it definitely needs to get a little bit more love. But um, yeah, it's a great model and I'm very impressed. It's dressy, but still a little bit sporty, which yeah. I like a lot. Yeah, I agree. I agree too. All right. All so, right. Uh, Catelyn, can we go to you next? I am still borrowing the Doxa Sub 1200. <laughs> We're just borrowing all the watches. <laughs> all the watches. If y'all knew. Like, Why do we even many... buy watches anymore? <laughs> I told you this. I don't think I'm buying a watch. I'll buy one watch when we're in Scotland. Okay. And I don't think I'm going to buy a watch this year. Yeah. I don't even get to wear the watches that I, this is, y'all, this is the most first world problem. I realize this. I sound so <laughs> pretentious and so ridiculous right now, but I don't even get to wear the watches that I have mm -hmm. because we, we have so many watches in for review and to borrow and stuff like mm -hmm. that now 
So I'm thinking, why would I buy another watch that I'm just not going to wear? I'm just going to wear everybody else's who sends them to me. There you go. Um, Strong so, strategy. Right? <laughs> That's what I thought. So I have the uh, the Doxa Sub 1200, which is our friend um, at Snake Rabbit Crows. I think that's the order of the mm-hmm. animals. It's something to do with a snake, a rabbit, and a crow. Um, but yeah, I'm. it's growing up. Even the orange color is really growing on me. Yeah. Um, but I'm still having like the bracelet issue. Like you guys can see, like it's really tight right now. But if I were to loosen up the clasp one, just like one, I feel like it's way too loose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll see. But I like it. I'm still really considering that the turquoise I know. that we got into a, an argument about yesterday on yeah. Doxa's Instagram page. <laughs> Did you see Doxa like They liked all, every, every single comment. comment. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Doxa, if you would like to see me one of those <laughs> to check out in person. Um, no. It's uh, info at 10 and 2.com. Yes, please. T E N N and 2.com. <laughs> Just DM me. Slide up in those DMs. <laughs> All right. And Josh, Josh is wearing something new too. I am. This is new to me. Um, I have had a Speedmaster professional for years and years and years. It's my longest tenured quote unquote, nice watch, but it hasn't been getting a lot of wrist time in recent years just because I've, I've gotten a few other pieces. And as much as I love the speedy pro, um, it just wasn't really fitting with the vibe I wanted. So I thought about it long and hard and managed to work out a really good trade on this Omega Speedmaster first Omega in space. And it's the numbered edition, which doesn't really mean anything to me. As far as I'm concerned, what I really like about this watch is that it is um, still Speedmaster, which is the watch that really got me into mechanical watches. I've been into watches for, you know, since teenage years. And it was the Speedmaster that really got its hooks in me for mechanical watches. And so I feel like I always want to have a Speedy in the collection. And I could never figure out why, like, I really like vintage pieces Mm -hmm. and I like vintage Omegas and vintage subs and things like that. But I have a sub that I really love that it's a 14060M four line and kind of like the least loved of all the subs. Like it's not vintage enough to be cool, but it's not the modern (laughs) ceramic model. But to me, it's the best model. And I could never figure out why when I was holding it next to like a vintage sub, like why do I like mine better than the vintage piece? And I think it's kind of going back to what you've got going on with that Grand Seiko over there is that it's sporty yet refined. Right. And I think that the Omega first Omega in space Speedmaster is the, it's still sporty because it's a Speedmaster, but it's also the most refined of all the Speedmasters that have been introduced, I think. And I am, I'm loving it. I was going to say I'm over the moon with it. And <laughs> oh, it, just, oh. it was totally unintentional. I wish that we could, we should get a soundboard <laughs> oh, so yeah. we can play the drum yeah. thing. I won't do I'll it. I'll sound yeah. There we go. All but right. I, I am over the moon with it. I t- I'm typically a bracelet guy. Yeah. And um, that's why the Speedmaster Pro wasn't getting much wear for me. Because if yeah. I wanted to wear something on bracelet, I was grabbing like three or four other watches mm-hmm. before I would, would get to it. And uh, with this being a 19 millimeter watch on strap, I, you know. I have no choice but to wear it on strap and there are some bracelets available, but I don't really like the way they look. I really like it on strap. And so now I get excited when I get Mm -hmm. into the watch box and I tried to put leather straps on the pro and it just, it wasn't the look I wanted. And and this is, this is really checking all the boxes. So I'm I'm psyched about it. It looks good on you too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If it's your vibe, your overall look. And I think with that one too, and and I struggle with that, with having so much of the same in my collection Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. And that's why this Grand Seiko does speak to me a little because it's so different. And then I'm yeah. not going to reach for anything else when I want to wear it because there's nothing else like it. And right. It's kind of like what you feel with that. There's not, you have all these sport watches, but then you have this that is that little bit more refined and you can play around with stuff. Um, you are looking at the, was it the Forsner? Is it the Forsner? The Forsner yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. You think you're going yeah. well, to try to get one on it? Did you get to see at the National Watch Club meeting? I did. No, I did. Someone, and, yeah. and I meant to because I've been contemplating getting one. Yeah. But I, I think that it's going to really drive like my. The look of them I think lot. it'll drive my OCD crazy because, like, there's so much gap between the case <laughs> and the bracelet. I think yeah. it'll drive me nuts, but I really like the look. Mm-hmm. It looks really cool. Um, we have a guy here in town, Kyle, yeah. at Oyster Soup. I think it's Oyster underscore soup but he's got some really cool watches and he has a forstner band on his speedmaster professional and i think it even looks better on the first omega in space i was stunned 
at how thin it is. Okay. And I want to say how flimsy it is, but that's <laughs> um, that's a discredit to the build quality okay. of the band. Like it's a very well-made band, mm -hmm. but it is a, uh, a reproduction of the old JB Champion astronaut bands that they wore. And those were specifically designed to break away okay. so that if there was an issue or something like that, like the band would break and, and obviously the watch I, mean, I guess you're in space, so it's not going to go too far too fast. It's float. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can probably recover <laughs> it. I was about to say the watch is going to fall, but it technically <laughs> won't in zero zero gravity. But um, it's it's wild how how thin and delicate it feels. But okay. because of the the sheer amount of links, mm -hmm. it actually has a lot more. I think it's is stronger than than I'm even giving it credit for. But yeah. the look is the look yeah. is. I really nice. personally think it'll look great on yours because it, to me, those bracelets, they have a, a lot of angles in them and, mm -hmm. and your first and again space is a little bit more angular than, mm -hmm. than rounded and curved like the regular Speedmaster. So yeah, yeah, I like it better with the alpha hands of the first and again space. I think I the agree. steel, like the yeah. look ties in together nicely. So, yeah. and I like what I like about it is it's not the Speedmaster you see all the time. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, it's different. That's what I like about my Speedmaster is it's not the traditional moon launch. It's not the one that people expect you to have. Mm -hmm. And same with the FL. Oh, yes, it's it's totally different. Like you really don't see them that often no. out and about, and I don't know why. Like it, it's an amazing watch. It's and I feel like I could have my Speedmaster and an FOIS and justify both, and I mean still go for both. Don't laugh at me. I'm yeah. not saying that I'm <laughs> going to do it. I'm just saying I could. Okay, well, I, I could do they... a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. You can. <laughs> I could, but I'm not going to. Yeah. I'm waiting on Doxa to send me the. the uh, Aqua, the Turquoise Aqua sub three, yeah. the Turquoise sub three hundred. Yeah, that's what I'm on. <laughs> well, they definitely have different vibes, and and you know this first Omega Space being a little bit more a little bit more refined than the yeah. typical Speedy Pro, I really like. And and there's some like I could I could get super nerdy and like there's a couple little Easter eggs of like it's a Walter Shira and you know the main father figure in my life was my uncle and his name was Walter and so Aww. like okay. when I when I see it like that matters to me. It doesn't really matter to anybody else, but yeah. like there's that and then like. These first Omega spaces are, this just so happened to be a luck thing, but everybody quotes the numbered edition as like the first two numbers and then a couple of X's. Like if you have a yeah. 2005, number 2005, you would quote it at like 20XX okay. on the Omega forums. And so this is in like an 81XX. It's an 8100 series of numbers, which... Mm -hmm. 81 is the year that my wife was born. And so like, this is like a couple little Easter eggs like that. It's, it's not a special watch. It's like mm -hmm. anybody could go buy one, but you made but, it special to you. Yeah. Well, and it's not yeah. even, like people get into all that numerology and stuff. And that's, it's cool if it really means something to you. Um, it doesn't make the watch any more collectible or special to anyone else, but you know, there are things that make me smile when I'm taking pictures of the back of the watch and I, I see the 81, like I think of my wife or, you know, if I'm playing around with the box and I see the Walter Shira, you know, I think about my uncle and, yeah. you know, things like that are, are cool and, you know, little intricacies of yeah. the hobby that are just fun. I'm like doing the math in my head. She's 38. Mm hmm. Can I she look looks like, like she's 25. I, yeah, I, thought, like, I, was I was older. Like, than, wait, I was like, I thought that you yeah. did. I mean, you did do exceedingly well. Like yeah. she's slumming it. Let's just be clear. Yeah. Um, but I thought that like you like really robbed the cradle there, and like <laughs> no, she's significantly, significantly older than me, like a lot. Wait, well, how, how old, old are you? Are you? Uh, I'm a year and a half younger than her. Yeah, like you said, <laughs> I like I was how you like, said she's significantly older than yeah. you are. As long as she looks as young as she does, I can make these jokes, and, yeah. and we've talked about it before. It's just, if she ever starts looking her age, I can't make the jokes anymore. Oh, but right, but right now, it. it's like the only thing I can give her grief about because yeah. she's perfect otherwise. So. Yeah, and it's age is just a number. So yeah, it is. Sam, she looks good though. Yes, she yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> I third that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's enough talking about Speedmasters yeah. and uh, Josh's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Just a whole different kind of podcast. Um, so let's talk about photography. But Josh, give us everything you know about photography in an hour. In an hour. <laughs> All right. Uh, lighting is everything. Keep your camera steady. Clean your stuff up and... Take some fun shots. All right, guys, we're done. See you later. Bye. Okay. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, um, so Josh is a is a phenomenal photographer. He was a an actual photographer for a profession for a very long time. Correct. 
I was, yeah. I've, I have done uh, quite a few different things in the photography mm -hmm. sphere over the years professionally from wedding and event photography to editorial stuff to, you know, I mean, I, I don't I don't know that there's anything I haven't done. I've done automotive. I've, I've done all kinds of stuff. And actually, automotive photography was the biggest teacher or the biggest help for the things that I now do with watches. Oh, really? Yeah. And it's it, it start, it's something that started as a hobby in my teenage years of just taking like pictures of my car and friends' cars and things like that. And when you're taking pictures of cars, you, you want to take pictures of the details too. So you're yeah. getting in close and, and you're dealing with these very large reflective objects. And then, you know, when I started taking photos of watches, like you're dealing with very small reflective objects, but reflective objects nonetheless. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it kind of, the stuff I learned there kind of got me jump started when I started taking photos of watches. And I've probably been shooting watches for I don't know, five or six years now. Um, my Instagram account is not that old, but uh, I was taking photos before that. And then, eventually decided to uh, create a, a separate Instagram account yeah. for the watch stuff. That's awesome. You're like goals for sure. Yeah, you are. <laughs> well, so, so I guess let's start with the basics. Yeah. Um, what are some of your basic tips and things for people who are doing watch photography? Yeah. So uh, I have a handy dandy printout here, so I don't forget this stuff, but uh, it's pretty easy. There's, I think, really about five key points to taking good photos. And it doesn't matter if you're using a cell phone or a regular camera or, you know, some crazy expensive professional rig. Um, you got to start with a, a clean lens and a clean watch. Like you wouldn't, if you're selling your house, you wouldn't take photos of a dirty house. Like if you're taking photos of your car to sell it, you wouldn't take photos of a, a dirty car. Like you clean up the things that you're going to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, and so especially people who use cell phones, I can't stress this enough because they live in your pockets, they live in your bags and the lenses on those just get so, so funky. So, you know, grab you like a microfiber cloth or like the, something that you would use to clean glasses or sunglasses or something like that. And, you know, just, you know, put a little bit of drop of water on your fingertip and just kind of get any smudge and oil and gunk off of the lens of your camera and then wipe it down with a microfiber cloth to dry it off. And just having a good clean lens and then cleaning up your watch as well. You know, a lot of times before I shoot watches of if like if I'm shooting a diver on bracelet or something, I will wash the watch. Like I'll put a little dish soap in my hand, like a drop mm -hmm. of, of hand soap and I will clean the watch and dry it. And then I will go back over it with a microfiber cloth to clean any like water smudges off of it. Yeah. Um, but having, having a clean lens and a clean watch and then just uh, a steady camera. Uh, I don't have the steadiest hands, even though I'm a, a photographer and I use a tripod for a lot of my shots and I used to not do that. And it just got to the point to where, uh, as a, as a little bit of a perfectionist at times, um, it was just driving me nuts to not have my shots be as sharp as I wanted them to. So if I'm using a camera, I'll use a tripod more often than not. And if I'm shooting with my cell phone, a lot of times I am using the self timer on the phone to like a three second self timer and I'm hitting the shutter button and then I'm bracing the camera against my chest, you know, like angled down for a wrist shot or something like that. So just being really steady, having a clean environment. And then beyond that, the biggest thing is just to watch for your reflections. You know, you're dealing with small reflective objects, uh, especially if you're dealing with a watch with a polished case and it can cause nightmares. So uh, it's especially really difficult if you're a person who shoots a lot with their cell phone. Mm -hmm. You almost are always going to get that reflection of the cell phone in the crystal or on yeah. the dial. Um, there's almost no way to get around it. So a lot of times what I'll do is just try to fill up the dial with the reflection of the phone. Mm -hmm. And that looks a lot better than like only having half the dial covered up yeah. with the reflection. Um, and I have a black phone, so it's pretty easy if you have a colored phone. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, you know, you can get like a case for it if you want to try to hide it or, yeah. <laughs> you know, or just embrace it yeah. and, and go with what you got. Um, but I think those those basics will really get a lot of people started yeah. pretty well. And just know that you're going to you're going to have to take a lot of shots. And, yeah. and it's a it's an endeavor that 
you learn as you go. And I've been shooting. I think I got my first camera when I was 16 and I'm 36 now. So I'm shooting for 20 years solid. Wow. And I still learn new stuff every time I shoot. So it's, uh, I don't say that to be discouraging. I say that to be encouraging, mm -hmm. um, that you will learn as you go. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Like it's part of the process and have fun with it. Yeah. You know? And, and a tip you gave me um, maybe a couple months back when we were here hanging out was uh, watch what you're wearing, too. And so uh, if I'm in the car, for, if I know I'm going to do a car shot later in the day, a wrist shot, I'll wear like a, a black hoodie or, or or a white, like just so the reflection is not like my red shirt mm -hmm. um, or whatever coming up. And then a tip that, that I've just kind of learned on my own is that um, I've bought those really big light diffusers that like pop open yeah. from Amazon, mm -hmm. super cheap. And I'm sure you've got them probably in the notes somewhere here mm -hmm. but uh i'll set one up in my car like on my windshield <laughs> or on the side there because yes. you get that bright the light and if i'm like do. at lunch i'm like right. oh this watch looks really good today i can catch a shot and not have so much reflection stuff going on there but i'm so yeah. proud to hear that like <laughs> you're so giddy right now <laughs> yeah so and i do i geek out on this stuff because like i said it's a, it's a rabbit hole as deep as watches themselves yeah um, but there's so much overlap in the hobby but you know you can go on amazon and there's all kinds, but the easiest thing to do is just search five in one reflector. I really like newer stuff. It's mm -hmm. N E E W E R. Um, but there's, I mean, it's, it's probably from Alibaba for all I know. Like it's Be careful getting that stuff from China, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> just with, saying, just saying. Get a reflector and some coronavirus. <laughs> 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 but but oh, yeah, like man. you can you can go on there and get a five in one reflector, and the way they come is you know they have a bunch of different things you can do with them, hence the five in one. But just unzip it, open it up, and take out the core of it, which is literally just a large circle of diffusion material. And diffusion material is the best thing in mm -hmm. the world for photography, period, mm -hmm. yeah. especially for watches. So the more diffuse you can make the light, the softer the light, the easier of a time you're going to have managing reflections. Um, you know, you're not going to have like these hot spots on on the watch where something is like crazy bright because of the sun reflecting on, you know, a lug or something like that. And being able to like, I would, you know, you could take that, put it in the windshield, like you said, just have that popped in your car. Some of them even like fold over on themselves and collapse down really small mm -hmm. and you could just keep it tucked behind a seat. Yeah. And then if you're in your car, you know, and the light's good or, you know, your watch is looking good or yeah. you're just feeling yourself at that moment, <laughs> you know, you you look at your wrist and you're like, dang, wrist, you look good. <laughs> you know, pop out that reflector and put it up in the window, like yeah. you said, and yeah. you've immediately got a large soft box to shoot within it's it's brilliant. Yeah, it's no bigger than my normal sun visor is. So yeah. like it's the same size essentially. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I just really want to drive to your work on your lunch break. And see, I don't think like, I <laughs> this whole like I look pretty ridiculous set up in your car. No more like crazy than we did when I was recording because I had like all this stuff and like I had people walking by and I, we were like recording a podcast at the same time in our and, car. Yeah. Oh, man. That's a good point. If you're podcasting or photographing, like, yeah. you just have to just, embrace, just embrace it. it. Yep. You I, embrace I think it. that's one thing too. Like we've learned is you really just let it go. Learn it is what it is. People are yeah. people are going to look at you like you're ridiculous. We're taking photos a lot too. It's not like, mm -hmm. yeah. And five seconds later, they're gonna forget they even saw you doing that silly thing. And yeah, you know, everybody's wrapped up in their own stuff. So exactly. don't don't worry about looking silly. You know, if somebody notices you, it's 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 going to be an afterthought to them yeah. in a matter of seconds. but Unless they're your family. My family gives me so much grief. Oh, yeah. My sister will take random things like potato chip or like random <laughs> objects to put it on her wrist and send me pictures of that randomly. That's hilarious. That's amazing. Oh, man. Good time. Family. You know? yeah, she's so sweet. Always there. <laughs> <laughs> Always there. Um, but yeah, the basics, I feel like, are all definitely very important. Um, but let's get into, like, start, like, what are your, what are your thoughts on, um, like, tips for wristwatch checks? Because that's what we were kind of talking about, like, Kat's talking about it with her car. Um, and I think that's probably realistically the number one photo that's done. Everybody likes a good wristwatch check. Um, yeah. Well, and I think because people, I, well, I personally, I want to see, especially watches that I may admire, I want to see them on other people's wrists and different sizes. And so that I can 
dream about them in my head and like figure out what they're going to look like <laughs> on my wrist. So I or, do. I, or I, somebody I, can just send it to you or and yeah. you get a better idea. <laughs> um, but no, I, yeah, I just, uh, and I enjoy taking them. I think they're, they're pretty quick and easy, especially if you're running out the door and you're like, oh, I want to get a shot for today. I don't feel like I've ever taken a quick and easy wristwatch. <laughs> really? like, okay. No, I, I envy people who do. I think I put too much thought into it. I don't know. <laughs> it's a whole situation. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think you're probably right. It is probably the number one photo of watches on Instagram. And I think, like you said, the reason, you know, you get context, you mm -hmm. get to see it on a wrist mm -hmm. and you can take a picture of the same watch on the same strap with different outfits and the photo looks different if mm -hmm. it's in different lighting and different scenes or things like that. So you can get a lot of variability in your photos through the wristwatch check format without having to shoot a bunch of different watches. Mm -hmm. And one point I really want to make, and this is something I've ran across with, with people who bring stuff up about growing Instagram accounts is just consistency. Like you don't have to have, uh, you know, some crazy perpetual calendar paddock to have a big following like mm -hmm. at Seiko SKX mm -hmm. is just an account that shares photos of SKXs and they just share a new photo every day. And they're like, I don't know, 75, 80,000 followers. Um, there's people who, uh, just take photos with their phones and they just do wristwatch checks. Yeah. And that's all they do, but they post a new photo every day and, their accounts are like thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people following them uh, just because they're consistent. So you don't need to have the best photography. You don't need to have the best camera. You don't need to have the best watches. All you have to do is just, you know, create content and participate within the community. And that's how you grow accounts. Um, so if you feel like your photography is not up to snuff, or you feel like your watches aren't anything that stands out or deserves to be shared, you can put those thoughts to bed because it's just simply not true. Like it's, if you put the content out there, your audience will find you mm -hmm. and like you will find the people that are of like minds. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't afford a perpetual paddock. Uh, I probably wouldn't spend the money on one if I had it. I'm not, that's not the circle I run with them, but the people who are interested in the types of watches I'm interested in, we have gravitated toward each other, each other on Instagram and, um, just me being who I am, I've gravitated towards a lot of other photographers as well. So, you know, I, I think if, if wristwatch checks are your thing, post those, if you mm -hmm. love them, post them and your wristwatch check crowd, your tribe will find you. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're, if you're wanting to do better wristwatch checks, you know, going back, everything's going to always go back to the basics. Just clean, like wipe your watch down in day to day living. Your watch is going to get funky. You know, wipe off your your lens on your camera, mm -hmm. um, on your phone especially. But if you're using a regular camera, just make sure you, you haven't got anything on the lens. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, diffuse the light if you can and get get like a nice stable base. Like anytime I do a wristwatch check, I'm bracing the camera against my chest. I'm bracing my phone against my chest. Um, actually if I'm shooting, if I'm shooting with my phone, I brace my phone against my chest. If I'm shooting with my actual camera, more often than not, I'm tilting the screen up so I can see it and I'm bracing the camera against my chin <laughs> and I look absolutely ridiculous, but I'm like, yeah. you know, braced against my own face, uh, against my chin to be able to get the angle that I want to get, to get the shot that I'm looking for. And again, just watching for those reflections in there. And I think a lot of people with wristwatch checks, you know, they get that, you get that context of what the watch actually looks like on your wrist. And I think the best thing you can do for that is don't get super, super, super close. Like don't get as close as the camera can go if you're using a cell phone, because when you get really close with a cell phone, they have these, these wider lenses and it gets really distorted and it makes the watch look way larger than it actually is mm -hmm. on your wrist. So back up a little bit, like more often than not, if I'm shooting with my phone and I'm shooting a wristwatch check, my phone will be up around my collarbone or just slightly lower than that. And my wrist will be much lower, like down around my belly. And the phone could focus closer than that, but it would just look distorted and weird. So yeah. Um, I think that's probably the number one thing I see that that looks a little odd in wristwatch checks is, is that super close up shot. Yeah, agree. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. So once you've 
like once you've got a stable shot and you've got the right distance to the camera and you're, you know, you're working your reflections around, I think the number one thing to do with a cell phone is just to use the timer. Like I said, I don't have the steadiest hands, but it's hard to be as steady as you need to be when you're moving your thumb around to hit a button on the phone. I think that's a great tip. I've never thought shutter. about that before. Yeah. yeah. And be aware uh, if you're in public and you're doing this with an iPhone, when you're using the, the self timer, it flashes a light every second. Okay. <laughs> so I use like the three second self timer and I'll hit the shutter and then you just, you know that you're going to get like three little pulses of light before it takes a photo and you're going to get some attention from the people <laughs> around you. So just be ready for that. It's going to look silly, but like I said, you just got to embrace it. So, yeah. um, I think that's, uh, the biggest thing. And then editing is a big thing. Um, you know, I try to keep my editing pretty simple. Uh, I think the more you can do with your lighting by using, something like a, a diffuser or some diffusion material. Uh, if you're doing wristwatch checks, having like a little portable diffuser, like we talked about that five in one reflector is a great tool to have with you. And you can get them in different sizes. They're about mm -hmm. 10 or 15 bucks. You can even get like a really small one and <laughs> you get a really small one and even hold it in your teeth mm -hmm. over yep. the, like you could have your phone in your hand and your wrist below the phone and you could hold the you know, you could have somebody give you a hand if you have somebody around, but if you're solo, you could actually hold the diffuser. Let's face it, most of the time we're solo. Yeah. <laughs> we're on our own. Yeah. yeah. You could hold it in your teeth and like hold it out over the top of the watch. And yeah. that alone is going to give you a, a much better photo. Yeah. You know, and you're talking about packing around a thing that's like a foot, mm -hmm. you know, super thin and yeah. a foot in diameter. And, um, you know, just little things like that are, are key. And, I want to reinforce what you said too about clothing and reflections. Like you're wearing a red shirt or a yellow shirt or something like that. It's going to reflect that color right back into whatever you're shooting. So being mindful of reflections, not only in things that can be reflecting, but colors that can be reflecting is yeah. a big deal. So there's uh, a lot of times where if I'm shooting uh, a wristwatch or a, a wristwatch check, I will, if I'm wearing something that is a color that I don't want to be reflected into the watch, like especially if I'm wearing a watch with a bracelet, I mm -hmm. like to have that side away from the light lit as best as I can. Mm -hmm. So I'll take a piece of printer paper from my office and I'll tuck it under my chin mm -hmm. and just let it fall down, you know, the front of my chest and that will bounce light back onto the bracelet. And it's just, uh, again, a testament to the silly things we do to get oh, good that's shots. That's a great but. tip and like one that has definitely upped my game and, and even taking photos on phone now are so much better because like, I figure if you know light, everything becomes a little bit better. And then of course the other tips like cleaning and stuff like that. But to me, like light is the most important thing. And, and yeah, I, I have a little piece of foam board I just even keep in the car for such occasions <laughs> and uh, yeah I just tuck, it, tuck it under the chin for uh, those shots but it definitely helps out uh, but yeah a little piece of paper does the same thing yeah I mean light really is everything that's it's it is what photography is it's yeah. capturing light and as you shoot more you will start to notice light more um, you know it's it's something that might seem a little nebulous in the beginning and you might just think, oh, I'm just going to grab my phone and take a picture of my wrist and what's the big deal. But the more you do it, if you're paying attention to the lighting, you're going to notice differences in lighting. Like what does harsh light look like? If the sun is shining directly in your dial, mm -hmm. you're going to notice like it's, it's, not, it's harsh light. And if the light is soft, like if it's an overcast day and it's really cloudy, everything just looks a little bit nicer. Yeah. So those sorts of things, just being able to detect differences is the first step in being able to use those to your advantage. So, you know, we can talk about some specific gear uh, and I think it is good. It, it is helpful to talk about specific gear, but with any, to any sort of photography, it always comes back to lighting. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. So I guess let's, let's go over some lighting stuff before we get into gear, just since we're already on the topic. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, so lighting, obviously definitely 
the most important thing. And I feel like, so Kat and I took like a half day photography <sighs> lesson with you a couple of months ago, which Quote unquote um, lesson. it really was, was though, because people, people have asked us, I think Ricky from Scottish watches said, what, like what happened? Because all of a sudden, like you guys really upped your game. And I wouldn't even say, I feel like I'm still the same. And Kat no, has just you, taken no. off like crazy, but and it was like just just that little thing and i never i mean you think about lighting and stuff like that but you don't think about it like you think about it when you're taking regular pictures but i don't feel like you have really thought about it with watch photography and how much like little tips like like using the pieces of board to reflect to reflect the light and and it cuts away the shot that awkward shadow you get on a flat lay um how much that really makes a difference in the photography um, so talking about natural lighting and artificial lighting, I know you you prefer using artificial light over natural light, correct? I do. And, and that is more a function of wanting a consistent level of results with the photos mm -hmm. that I produce. Natural lighting is obviously variable. Like there's sunny days, there's overcast days. And it can be a little trickier to work with natural light, but also it can be a lot simpler to work with natural light. Mm -hmm. um, with artificial lighting, you have to set up whatever you're going to be setting up. It costs me, money. <laughs> it does. It costs money. You know, natural light is free. Yeah. <laughs> but making your own light doesn't have to be expensive. And I think one of the things that one of the, the best received posts I've ever made was how to take photos with a desk lamp like you can you can do some pretty good stuff with just a simple desk lamp and one of those five in one reflectors yeah with uh using the diffusion part of it to diffuse that desk lamp and i think that if you're using natural light the best thing you can do is to find a window and then find a way to diffuse the light that's coming in through that window and we talked about this on the live stream that we just did, but even if you can use the same window mm -hmm. all the time, that's even more helpful because then you know that like at whatever, from like four to 6 PM, this window right here is getting good light in it. And then you can get some diffusion fabric. Like you don't have to have a, a really big lighting setup. You can just use a window and a $15 piece of diffusion fabric. And, you know, we'll put it in the show notes, um, given Catlin work here to put stuff in the That's show fine. notes. If but, you've looked at the show notes, yeah. it's, <laughs> it'll be nothing. <laughs> but you see that you can go on Amazon and, and search for newer N E E W E R white seamless diffusion fabric. And you can get a very, very large piece of diffusion fabric for 14 and a half dollars USD. Um, it's like 1.8 by 1.5 meters, like whatever, five by six feet big. And you can just tape that over a window and when you're not using it, you can just fold it up and put it away, but you can just pop it out, tape it over a window, clamp it to your blinds or, or whatever. And you've got a, now you have a very large soft box. That is essentially what I paid money to purchase to be able to set up myself every time I take watch photos. So get you some of that diffusion material and put that over a window and you've immediately got much better light. And then, like you said, you can use, like I use white printer paper a ton because it's handy. I just fold it in half. It mm -hmm. creates this little V. I'll do that for multiple pieces of paper and kind of like surround the watch. Mm -hmm. And then, so I have a window with a piece of diffusion fabric over it, or I might have my softbox set up with my video light and I have it coming in. And then I have opposite that light. I have these like V'd out little pieces of printer paper. And then I just lay a watch in the middle of it that I cleaned up so it doesn't have dust all over it and dirt and grime. I lay it down there and then I grab the camera and typically I'll put it on a tripod, but I, I might hand hold it as well. And I just, boom, there you go. You've got yeah. like this nice, beautiful, soft lighting scenario to be able to put a watch in. So obviously this is a little trickier with wrist shots. Like you can do the same exact thing, um, with the diffusion material, but like we said, you might have to do something kind of silly, like tuck a piece of paper or foam core board under your chin or wear a white shirt is the easiest solution. But you can also do the same thing if you want to take the watch off and get a photo of the watch sitting on a table with some things like maybe some stuff and some watches. You know, <laughs> that's kind of the origin of my account was I was like, oh, I take pictures of stuff and I take pictures of watches. So yeah. 
stuff and watches. So, um, you know, I'd just put that stuff on a table and then I'd set up one light. All my photos are just one light setups because you can do more than that, but, but why? Like, just keep it simple. Don't yeah. make it harder on yourself. Um, I set up one light, I set up some, some bounce panels for reflections and, um, and to kind of fill in the shadows a little bit. And that's pretty much what I do to get, to get good photos, whether it's wrist shots or, or flat lays or pocket shots or, or anything like that, that principle applies no matter what. And yeah. you can create that light yourself and you can go high, high up to like easily you could spend a thousand dollars on a video light and a soft box and, and tripods and, and all these different light modifiers. Uh, or it can be something as simple as a window and some printer paper or foam core board and a $15 sheet of diffusion material that you pick up off of the Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Get nerdy on gear? gear. Yeah. I'm good to get nerdy on gear. <laughs> all right. Get nerdy on gear. <laughs> So, uh, I know that when we were talking about doing this podcast, you guys were asking about different cameras for different budget setups and you both fairly recently went through these same decisions yourself. Yeah. Like you were looking at buying cameras like I, Catlin, obviously know when you bought your camera cause I sold it to you. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> you have my old camera and Kat, you have had your Sony for how long? Um, I've had my Sony for four or five months now. Okay. Yeah. So you guys are still pretty green on the camera front. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, there's a lot of different ways you could go with this. Um, a lot of people use digital SLRs. They use Nikons or Nikons for our over over the pond people. Oh. They, I was I, I was very confused. I was yeah, like, where's Nikon coming from? Apparently, calling it Nikon is is taboo oh. in, in Scottish circles. Oh shoot! Oh, in so, Scottish circles. Yeah, I mean. Oh. Just going on what I heard, but, <laughs> but Nikon or Nikon uh, or Canon, um, if you're using a digital SLR, the biggest tip I can give you, if it has the ability to use live view, use that function and it's going to eat through your battery like nobody's business. Pick up a spare battery or two, yeah. um, charge them up because it's, it's going to eat the battery up. But being able to use that live view so that you can see what your camera is seeing rather than looking through the viewfinder and making adjustments based on like a light meter. It's way easier if you can actually see what the camera sensor is going to see. And I think that specific fact is why so many people are switching to mirrorless cameras. And I think you guys both did excellent for your first cameras because you both went mirrorless. And I think the advantages to that are so profound because what you see is what you get on the back of the camera, mm -hmm. uh, either on the back of the camera or through the viewfinder, you're actually seeing the end result. So if you have something reflecting in the dial, you're immediately seeing that. And mm -hmm. uh, when I started my account, on uh, my Instagram account, I was still using my professional Canon digital SLR gear from being a professional photographer. Okay. and I was having to take so many shots to get the results that I wanted because I couldn't see what the camera was seeing. And it was very, very frustrating, quite honestly, to, to take so many shots and still be dissatisfied with the results <laughs> yeah. because like, you're just it's like it's, the story yeah. of 90% of my <laughs> one shot. <laughs> yeah. It, but being able to see what the camera sees makes such a big difference yeah. because you can like for me personally, I love having a little bit of light reflecting in the crystal. Mm -hmm. Like that's just something that I reflecto going on the there. Hashtag yeah. Flecto. Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, I love that look. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, you're talking about a millim like probably a fraction of a millimeter of movement of mm -hmm. the camera one way or another or your subject one way or another will influence whether that crystal is completely swallowed up by glare yeah, or if it's just like a little kiss of, of reflection right on the edge of the crystal. <laughs> and so, you know, that's what I like to do is I like to use that live view to be able to see the differences and you can also check your exposure. So, you know, mm -hmm. if the photo is going to be dark or, you know, if it's going to yeah. be too bright, um, again, watches are these smaller little reflective objects and because of that, they can really trick a camera's light meter. So you yeah. might take, you know, you might pull, pull out your camera and take three or four shots thinking that everything's going to be fine. Um, but you look at them later and it's like, oh, it's like the whole case is blown out. Yeah. Um, you know, you might, you might have a watch like this first Omega in space. I have to shoot it a little dark because of the polished lugs on the top, on the top side of the lugs, they're polished. I have to shoot those a little darker and then 
I'll have to go in and kind of edit the dial to be a little bit brighter sometimes because those lugs can really catch a lot of light and they'll just completely blow out and then you have no information there and it, it looks really weird yeah when you have like this glowing orb <laughs> you know, <a laughs> dial surrounded by like these four glowing horns yeah. because it's so bright so mirrorless is huge and I mean, Sony is kind of on top of the game when it comes to sensor tech. And I'm personally, when it comes to mirrorless, I'm way more of a Fuji fan. Um, I just preferred the control format, mm -hmm. but that's all personal preference stuff. Um, you know, by and large, cameras these days are, are more similar specs wise than they've probably ever been. Mm -hmm. And so you can honestly go into a Best Buy or uh, any kind of camera shop or electronic store and handle a Sony or a Fuji. See what feels better in your hand because mm -hmm. you're going to shoot more if you have a camera that feels good to shoot. Yeah. And that is, um, you know, don't, don't pick necessarily on brand. Pick something that feels good, that fits your hand. And then just pick a lens to go with it. Yeah. I feel like, like you nailed it right there. Just like pick the body that you really, really like because lenses like, they're one in a million. You're going to find the right lens for it, mm -hmm. no matter mm -hmm. what. So, like, right. you want that feel in your hand. Of, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I, I love that Sony. Like, I, I love her Fuji a lot too. But the feel that I get in my Sony, it's just like it makes me happy when I pick it up to take pictures. I yeah. don't know why. Just the grip on it and everything. But uh, the grip on yours is really nice. Yeah, I like I it. Say. It's very like ergonomic, I guess, too. But yep. yeah, I just I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, you can pick based on specs, but like I said, mm -hmm. things are so close these days. Yeah. It's not really worth it. And I think that um, with Sony and Fuji kind of being on top of the game right now with their with their affordable mirrorless technology, yes, um, those are the two systems that I think are best for people to start out with. If you're buying fresh, if you're not, if you're starting from scratch, you can get the camera body that you have, Cat, the Sony A six thousand mm -hmm. for three hundred bucks. You oh used, yeah, yeah, less than you know, less than yeah. that. You can get a Fuji X T one or an X E two or you know any any number of the Fuji bodies that are available for a couple hundred bucks as well. Like $300 will get you a lot of camera in a Fuji or a Sony. And there are some other systems that are worth looking into like Panasonic and Olympus. They have some really good stuff, especially if you're looking to do like dual photo and you're mm -hmm. interested in video too. Yeah, vlogging and stuff like that too. Yeah, yeah. Panasonic is really, really good for that. Um, Olympus is kind of like the, you know, they, they kind of get left by the wayside, <laughs> but they make some good cameras as well. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think it's always like it too. Just yeah. Throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> As a, if your budget allows. <laughs> if you're, yeah. yeah. I think there's, there's one guy that we know who, who shoots Leica exclusively. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not at his budget. Yeah. I, um, I, as a former Leica owner, I've owned a few of their cameras in the past and, and several lenses and, I do not own any Leicas anymore. I still have a lot of love for the system, mm -hmm. um, but they just don't do what I need them to yeah. do. They look cool as hell, though. They yeah, do look. Yeah. They do look nice. I, and I they think are, you limit edition looks really nice. <laughs> yeah. All that gray. And they're fun to shoot. They yeah. are. They're a lot of fun to shoot. But um, you know, hammers are fun to swing, but yeah. you you don't use them to cut things. Like you yeah. have to have the right tool for the job. Uh, and Leicas are, are great cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, there are very few cameras in the Leica. There are very few cameras and lenses in the Leica ecosystem that would work for watch photography. Yeah. Um, not to say you can't use them for that, mm -hmm. but it's that's not what they're designed for. Leicas yeah. were designed for for photojournalistic documentary yeah. coverage. But for like the stuff that we do or just an all in one flexible system, like you really can't go wrong with a, an interchangeable lens system like a Sony or a Fuji. I would say um, a lot of the budget stuff you're going to look into and all of Fuji stuff pretty much short of their medium format stuff, but pretty much the budget Sony stuff, the budget Fuji stuff, it's all what's called a crop sensor camera. Mm -hmm. And so the lenses are going to be pretty comparable between the two systems. So like a Sony a6000 and their 30 millimeter f1.4 lens I think you can get that that setup used and there's a retailer in the United States called keh.com yeah um, I have bought a ton of stuff from them over the years and they are an excellent company to deal with I can mm -hmm. highly recommend them um, not sponsored at all. If yeah. KEH does want to sponsor me, hit me, hit me up. <laughs> Everybody yeah. try to get the sponsors know, on this yeah. podcast. I mean, I've bought, I mean, 50 plus cameras from them over yeah. the years, hundreds of lenses. Like they're, 
and you return can, return policy is really good with six them month, too, six yeah. month warranty on oh, used wow. gear like you don't normally get that sort of stuff with used stuff like an ebay type auction yeah you, you're not going to get and the prices months. are actually because i bought a couple lenses from them and yeah. the prices are comparable what you're getting from ebay and you feel a lot safer yeah um their rating system is really nice too you know what you're getting there's no mm -hmm. surprises when it comes in the mail yeah, um, yeah I, I fully agree with that. Yeah, I highly recommend them. And, and I'm not typically one to tout um, companies or brands too much. Like everything's, you know, everybody has their favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the second you you tie yourself to a brand <laughs> or a company, the, they're going to do something that reflects poorly on you. But KEH has been in, in business long enough. And, and I would 100% recommend that if you are on a tight budget do not be afraid to buy used camera gear yeah. um you know that one of the biggest reasons i bring this company up is because you never really know who you can trust and and there are some companies out there like bnh photo and adorama they sell used gear as well but i don't know any company that's selling used gear with a warranty mm -hmm. like a six-month warranty um or three-month warranty like keh is so that's a, a good resource for people who are looking for gear. But I think a, a Sony a6000 or an a6500 or an a6400 or an a6600, whatever your budget will allow for the body, there's all kinds of noise. <laughs> what that was? This is like this is howling or something. Yeah. All the woo girls. All of a sudden, oh, wait, it is. I mean, it's Saturday. Y'all might hear some live woo girls on the show today. Yeah. yeah. You think you Man. just get that one little We're like, in the we're intro. two blocks from Broadway. We are. So we are. it's possible. Yeah. The pedal taverns go right down first and that's come exactly right second, what we're so hearing. Is a, we're actually pedal taverning after the podcast. Yeah. Oh, no, man. not really. I really want to <laughs> dress for that. Today. I, oh, no, 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 no. It's cold outside. Yeah. <laughs> like, but I do really want to do a pedal yeah. tavern. On Actually, a, we need to. We need a Watts Club meetup on a pedal tavern. A pedal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like all the basic bitches in the Watts Club. Like, yes. let, let's go on. Let's do this. All right. Back to photography. Back to photography. Yeah. No, I think gear wise, like a, an A6000 or, or any A Alpha Series Sony body and yeah. then or a Fuji XT line or an XE line body, you know, buy the best that your budget can afford. Yeah. Like there mm -hmm. are upgrades that happen as you go higher up in price, but you can also get an X-T1 or an A6000 and mm -hmm. be just fine. Yeah. Uh, if you're going Sony, the, the 30 millimeter F1.4 lens is a lens that I think is universally beloved by Sony users. Um, when it comes to Fuji, their 23 millimeter F2 lens and their 35 millimeter F2 lens are both fantastic lenses. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that 35 millimeter F2, the one that you have, Catlin, is a, an exceptionally good lens. Um, and if you have a little bit more money, you can get the 35 1.4. Um, it's going to be a little better for low light mm -hmm. general photography. Yeah. Uh, as far as watches go, it does focus a little bit closer. So you can, you can not have to contort yourself twice, yeah. quite so much for that makes a big difference. Shot. It really does. It really yeah. Does. I just bought like a 50 millimeter 1.8, I think lens. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be like, Whoa, yeah. I, I didn't realize that yeah. it's like really far away now. I don't like that at all. Yeah. It's, it's once you get into that, once you get past 35 millimeter yeah. on a crop body camera, it's, yeah. You, you're taking wrist shots unless yeah. you're like it's hard. six foot nine and you have, <laughs> super you know, long arms, arms that are dragging, <laughs> then like you're not going to be able to do a, a wrist shot with it without using some type of like, yeah. I'll, like I do pocket shots a lot because I just like the way they look and, and I use my phone connected to my camera with mm -hmm. Wi-Fi to be able to see what the camera sees so I can stand in front of the camera and, and take the shot from yeah. my phone. But, but when it comes to wrist shots, like sometimes I'll do wrist shots with my longer 80 millimeter lens too. And I still have to use my phone with yeah. the Wi-Fi because it I can't, be so far away. I can't handhold the camera yeah. I, I, much more than 35 millimeters. And I'm, I'm so far away that I can't see the screen of the camera anymore. So something in that like tw 18 to 23, 24, 28, 35 millimeter range yeah. um, is a really good, is a good bet. And if you're shooting, if, if there's any Fuji uh, shooters listening, uh -huh. Fuji has an 18 to 55 millimeter zoom kit lens. That is a really good lens and you can get some close up adapters. Um, and if you're shooting Sony, you can do the exact same thing. They have a comparable kit lens, a kit zoom. And that way you can kind of zoom the lens in and out. I'm, I'm way more of a prime shooter. Mm -hmm. Um, just a fixed focal length 
know exactly what you're going to get before the camera ever gets up to your eye. Yeah. But, and I, I think it makes people think more about their photos mm -hmm. and I always recommend prime lenses to new photographers. Yeah. But, and there's always a, but <laughs> if you're finding that a prime lens is very frustrating, it, may benefit you to get a zoom lens so mm -hmm. that you can you can adjust the focal length to yeah. fit the scene because people's arms are only so long if you're trying yeah, to get this exactly. right. um, if you're shooting like a watch laying down on a table like a flat lay or something like that a little bit more focal length is really helpful so yeah. like for that type of stuff a 30 millimeter is as short a lens as I'd use. Like mm -hmm. something like a 35 is a little bit better or even like a 50 mm -hmm. or you know, an 80, 85, something like that is yeah. going to benefit you even more. Yeah. I, I was actually just going to say that, that um, don't, don't be afraid or you don't have to go and buy another lens. If you've got the kit lens with the camera for a long time, all I had was my 16 to 50 millimeter Sony, mm -hmm. Sony lens. And I liked it and I could use it for all sorts of things, not just wrist shots. So it was like very universal and, uh, you can get different angles and stuff like that and different, you know, closeness to the, uh, the watch, but it's cheap. And then sometimes it comes with the camera. A lot of people have it. And, uh, I actually, I broke mine on a trip. I'm oh, even no. looking at picking one up again, just cause it's yeah. really small, yeah. really compact. You can stick it in your jacket pocket. It doesn't take up a lot of space just to like, just to have around, just to kick around with. But yeah, they're, they're definitely useful. Don't feel like you have to like go buy a, you know, a prime lens or something right away. Play around with that first or, and, and I, I totally get what you're saying when you say the prime lenses are a little bit better because with the zoom lenses, you might accidentally touch it and you just like ruined your shot. Cause like you had it just right mm -hmm. and you messed it up now. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes it is better to have that prime lens on the, on the camera for sure. Yeah. yeah. And when I was, when I was getting into photography, zoom lenses weren't as good back then as they yeah. are now. Like they've, they've come a long way in lens design. And another tip that I can mention for people is if you're using an actual camera setup, stop your lens down, which is to say that the F stop number, like try to pop it out of like auto mode and at least put it in a, like Canon calls it a for aperture priority. Um, with Fuji, you set all the dials to a, except for the lenses aperture and you adjust that um, with Sony there's some there's going to be an equivalent aperture yeah, priority a. Yeah, a. A. Too, Mo yeah. most use a um, you can leave everything else on auto if you want and just start playing with the aperture to see how it affects the photo and the thing with zoom lenses is that a lot of times if you have them at the very bottom of their f-stop range like if you have the aperture all the way open like at f4 mm -hmm. they can be really soft like the results can be a little low quality but if you stop those lenses down to like f8 mm -hmm. modern lens design is such that it's going to sharpen up any lens even yeah. even the cheapest kit zoom these days is going to get a lot sharper so if you can shoot at f8 you're not going to have that super blurry background look that you might see some other people get mm -hmm. with with higher quality and more expensive lenses but you take a cheap lens and you still stop it down to f8 you're gonna get a sharp crisp shot yeah and the only trade-off is is that it can be a little tricky to get the photo as bright as you need it to be at that point yeah but if you're using uh you know even a modicum of light you can you can work around that even yeah. if you just let the camera control everything else um pop it out of pop it out of full auto mode and and put it in aperture priority and set it at like f5.6 or f8 and then just let the camera do everything else. But I guarantee you do that and you're going to immediately start seeing better results in your photos. So, you know, I think that kind of covers the basis of the like, you know, kit lenses, budget setups. And if you want to go beyond that, I think where you need to start thinking is like, obviously what, what your budget is and what do you want to deal with to get quote unquote, better photos. Mm -hmm. So if you're a person who really prefers wrist shots, then I would really recommend upgrading your lens because a better lens is going to give you better results. Mm -hmm. If you're a person that really likes flat lays and you like really well lit stuff, put that money into a lighting setup. Um, if you're struggling because your camera is 
a little slow to focus or, you know, the, the photos look a little low quality, focus on upgrading your camera body. You know, you ideally would just get all the best things, but yeah. you know, realistically we're rock, we're all working with a budget mm -hmm. and some people just don't want to have a bunch of money invested in camera gear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So think about the types of shots that you enjoy making and you enjoy viewing. And this is something that as someone with a big account, you know, people will contact me and ask me what kind of camera lens I use or what kind of camera body I use. But I rarely have people message me and ask me about the lighting of a shot. And I mean, I think we've said it many times before and you can never say it enough. Lighting is the most important thing. And I wish more people who wanted to make good photographs would contact me and say, Hey, how did you light that? Mm -hmm. You know, like this shot looks great. Your lighting looks really good in this shot. Or you might not even know that the reason the shot looks good is the lighting, but just contact me and say, Hey, why does this shot look yeah. like this? Yeah. And I think that myself and pretty much every photographer in the, the watch sphere, the Instagram watch world would be happy to talk about that stuff because that's the stuff that we nerd out on, you mm -hmm. know, like and nobody asks about it. We have yeah. to talk to each other about that sort of stuff. And I don't know of anybody who wouldn't be happy to share that information with somebody who was genuinely curious and that wanted to improve their photography. You know, think about what you want. Think about your your quote unquote upgrade path, as, mm -hmm. as you might call it, and kind of go from there. Um, you don't need a ton of money to get good photos, but you can definitely spend a ton of money yeah. if you want. Um, you know, you guys have talked about it before on yeah. the podcast, like yeah. the watches I could buy with the yeah, you know yeah. the money I've spent on gear. And, and I think of it, you know, I think of it in that way too. Like I'm continually balancing, like, do I want a new watch or do I want a new lens? That yeah. was like a serious conversation that we had had. Yeah. I think before you had done with the FOIS was you were contemplating like a new camera. Was yeah. it a new camera? Yeah. 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 New ca I mean, it's always new camera, new lighting, new <laughs> yeah. lenses right now, right now I'm trying to decide, do I want to get an additional camera or because something came out that I really like, mm -hmm. <laughs> or do I want to keep saving for a watch that I want? Yeah. And you know, it's, 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 it's the struggle. constant because balance. They're, they're both hobbies of ours and they're, sure. they're things that like we enjoy and I've, I'm definitely getting more into it and I think it's fun and you think it's fun too. Yeah, like definitely. When we sit down with our watches to take pictures. When we were in San Francisco, I had the best time. Like we were just like <laughs> hanging out on the beach taking watch photos. <laughs> Not even like, paying attention to what was going yeah. on, but yeah. just taking watch photos. It's fun. And it it's really is. so much fun. But I think that's where like... A lot of people may not realize that there's such a big used market for camera gear because mm -hmm. that's po that's people something upgrade. that I didn't even yeah. realize. Like I was planning on buying, you know, whatever the I remember DMing you like, you know, uh, Black Friday sales. Like that's when I'm going to buy a camera. Like what's the best quality camera under this budget? And mm -hmm. I was looking at buying new or new, um, and then like realizing that there's a whole used market. And for for the money that I spent on a used setup, I was, I got a much better setup than what I was going to spend the exact same money on, you know, new at a store, even on mm -hmm. sale. Um, so I think, you know, and I am fortunate enough that I am very familiar with you. You know, you and I have been friends for quite a few years, but there's so many people who are in this hobby of watches who have friends who are Instagrammers or whatever, who are photographers and reaching out to those people and saying, you know, here's my budget. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, um, what would your recommendations be? Because a lot, like you just directly sent me links to, mm -hmm. to use gear and everything else. And, and that gets you into this without investing quite as much as you would really anticipate. It's holding off maybe on a watch purchase, but for me, I know it's something that was very important. I wanted a nicer camera to take family pictures and things like that. Anyways, though, I have not taken one picture of my child <laughs> on this camera, not a one, like, no, not at all. Um, so uh, hypothetically, at some point, I'll take other pictures. But hypothetically. <laughs> hypothetically. Um, and then it brings up a really good point because we've talked about cell phone photography a lot. And I see this in your notes um, that you had. Um, like, I, I did cell phone for so long. And you can do really phenomenal cell phone pictures. I'm, none of us are saying that you can't because you definitely can. Um, but, you know, your tip is to skip a phone upgrade. 
for yeah. a year. I know people who upgrade their phones once a year, like mm-hmm. or every time the new iPhone comes out. But if you just skip that, that eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars, that's a really badass camera setup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can buy a camera body, a yeah. lens, a lighting setup. Yeah. Props like you could you can build a studio for that kind of money right uh, from scratch and it a lot of people don't I, th- I think camera gear can be daunting mm-hmm. when people look it at it be. they they don't know what to buy there's so much out there you don't even know where to start and then you think about lighting and you think about you know like memory card it, it all adds up so much but if you just keep it really really simple. You know, maybe skip a skip a phone upgrade like, like, you know, like I have listed right here. Like I did not want to forget that point. And, and it's not my point. It's not original thought. Many people have said this before. But for the money that you would spend to upgrade your phone, you can do so much with with used gear. And it's just like watches like you, there's just so much value there. Um, I can't I can't reiterate it enough to like what you can get. As, adv- as advanced as cameras are these days mm-hmm. for the money, this used to not be the case. Like I would say this is only something that has happened in the last handful of years that camera tech has has come so far that cameras are so well made now. You've never, ever been able to get as much camera for the money now as like it, it's it's almost incomprehensible to a photographer like me. I mean, when I started shooting – you know, it, you'd get like a Nikon D50 and a kit lens and it was like a thousand dollars, you know, it's like, wow. Like what I, I had to save up for, yeah. for months and months and mm-hmm. months to be able to buy my first digital SLR and one lens and the lens was cheap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the body cost so much. And now it's, it's, it, it just blows my mind yeah. how affordable good gear is. And I, I know that if photography is not someone's um, main thing, uh, they may not be so inclined to part with their money. And I get that. Like I'm, I am frugal to say the least. Um, but if it's, if it's something, if you enjoy even seeing other people's photographs and you think to yourself, like, Hmm, like you think maybe you can't take photos that are that good. Mm -hmm. Um, even if it's with your phone, just start practicing and, I think one of the coolest things about photography, and I'm going to fanboy on photography pretty hard right now, <laughs> but the one of the coolest things about it is that this is a hobby where very few of us are able to buy all the watches that we want. So, you know, you may not, you may be able to have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. Like you have to be selective about what you purchase. And some people just don't want to spend much money at all on watches. So Mm -hmm. even though they could go out and buy something that's really high end, they just don't see the point in it. You know, they may only want to spend a thousand dollars on a watch and no more with photography. It gives you an avenue to enjoy this hobby, particularly the intersection of watches and Instagram and the community that is the, the watch photography community. It gives you a way to enjoy the hobby with the same watch without making any changes whatsoever, like over and over and over again, almost on a daily basis, if you want to continue to create content. And to me, that is something that's really cool that photography offers. And anybody who in just enjoys photos of watches at all. Even if you've never considered taking them yourself and you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know what this guy's talking about, about (laughs) apertures and diffusion and all this stuff. Like just, just try to take some photos yourself and start sharing them and create a separate account for it because, Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to, um, but (laughs) posting photos of watches, you know, can be misunderstood by the general public to be a little bit ostentatious, <laughs> which is, I think, why so many of us have separate accounts for our watch photos. But, you know, just cr- create a separate account. It's easy. Start sharing photos and start getting involved in the community. Yeah. And it's just it's such a way to make your your enjoyment of the hobby go so much further, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I personally only really enjoy buying watches around special occasions. Um, I'm just too inclined to like let things go 
too easily if yeah. I just buy it because I wanted it and then I kind of fall out of love with it. Yeah. If I tie it to a special occasion, well, I, I kind of like have to keep it. We talked about like a good start is start with your cell phone. Start yeah. doing some of these other tips. And if you enjoy that and you enjoy getting better photography, then then yeah, then you can kind of upgrade from there. I think that's yeah. a good starting place though, for sure. Yeah. And I think um, one of the reasons that, that going into somewhere and holding the cameras in hand, if you can, uh, and you definitely don't have to, you can just pick something and go with it and you're going to learn how to use it and it's going to be fine. But if you, if you are so inclined to pop into a, a local electronic store and, and try something in hand, whatever you get, you're buying into an ecosystem that you can continually upgrade as you go. So if you buy a Sony a 6,000 and a 30 millimeter F 1.4, or you buy an XT one and a 35 millimeter F 2 you've got that set up to begin with, and then you can buy a new lens and keep the same body, or you can buy a new body and keep the same lens. And you can just keep upgrading incrementally, honestly, for a couple hundred bucks at mm -hmm. a time, realistically, and, and never really feel the sting of like a multi-thousand dollar watch purchase. Yeah. Like yeah. you can really spread the pain out with cameras. <laughs> 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 Just don't add up all of yeah, the ne no. Yeah, no. Never add up the camera here. Never add up the watch box value. Never add up yeah. the watch box value. That's for sure. Mm -mm. Yeah. 100% for sure. <laughs> don't do it. Well, so before we wrap things up, let's talk about um, after after the shot. Like, let's talk about software and editing. Yeah, that also can be a very daunting thing because there's so many things out there available. And there's a lot of apps that are available now. Um, on your phone, you can just search photo editing in the app store or whatever Android people call that place. What is, what is it? The marketplace? <laughs> I like how you said Android people. I don't know what they're trying they're to prove. a whole Anyways, that's, different sorry, type that's of a, person. That's a side note. That's we are not discriminatory <laughs> against Android people here. I just don't all, know what they're trying to prove. All phone people are welcome. <laughs> it's fine. Y'all y'all yeah. can send your, your shitty comments and DMs yeah. to at stuff and all, watches. All hate mail to at stuff and watches DM <laughs> inbox. But they will probably be ignored. <laughs> but... You know, there's so there's so much stuff out there. Um, I mean, Adobe's editing suite is kind of the I would say the gold standard, but it's it is the most accepted platform. So things like Lightroom, Lightroom Mobile, Photoshop, Photoshop Express, you can get Photoshop Express for free on your desktop. I think you can get the app for free as well on your phone. Um, Lightroom Mobile has a free app and mm -hmm. you can also uh, pay a subscription and have cloud-based storage and more photo editing tools at your disposal. Mm -hmm. I do all that stuff because, I mean, photography is, is kind of my thing, so I pay the money for it. But you don't have to pay money for it. Um, you can check all that stuff out. You can check programs like Snapseed. Make it really easy. That's available on Android or iOS formats. Just find a program that, that kind of works for you. Search around, check things out, especially the free ones, like try them. Like mm -hmm. there's no no harm in, in trying different yeah. programs. Find something that works for you. And if you do the work up front with, you know, trying to find a way to kind of soften your light up a little bit with some sort of diffusion or bouncing some light around to kind of fill in some shadows, that can make such a big difference in the level of editing editing that you need to do on the back end. Mm -hmm. I personally try to do as much on the front end before taking the photo as possible so that I don't have to edit very much because I don't personally enjoy editing. Yeah. Other people really love that process and they'll be in Photoshop for hours on end manipulating a photo. Um, and if that's, that's your bag, then that's awesome. Like the m more respect to you. But if you're somebody that's just kind of dipping their toes in this, in these waters, I would definitely recommend something like Lightroom Mobile or Snapseed. And you can just use the camera that's on your phone to start with and then pull that photo that you took into Lightroom and sharpen it a little bit. You know, you can search for whatever phone you're using. You can search, just run a Google search for the best sharpening settings for that phone. Yeah. Or if you're using a camera, what are the best sharpening settings for this camera? Because Fuji cameras and Sony cameras, their files operate a little differently and you sharpen them a little differently. Okay. So, um, question for me is as far as, you know, we talked about like some sharpening things on apps and then uploading them specifically with Instagram, it does compress the files a little bit. So is there anything you recommend as far as numbers go? And I'm sure it, it depends on what camera you're using and lens, but any, is there a general range that you're looking at? 
Yeah. So with that stuff, there's definitely some, some Instagram tomfoolery going on. We'll keep it PG here. <laughs> but uh, um, Instagram is a bit of a bear when it comes to the way that they compress images. So what I will recommend, because if somebody's listening to this right now, I could tell you something and then next week it could change. So if you really want to know the best thing is just run a search, a Google search of like what the maximum image size Instagram will take. And you can upload that specific size and it will take away their compression okay. that they might add to the photo. And having said that, I don't bother with any of that personally. Okay. Um, if I'm doing photos for, you know, a brand or something like that, uh, which I do periodically, I'm going to want to deliver high resolution photos to them. And I've had enough times where people have contacted me asking for high resolution photos that I don't like to edit photos and then downsize them and, mm -hmm. and do web size and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I just keep it simple. If something, if you're uploading photos and they're looking crappy and you think it's because of Instagram's compression, I would absolutely search for how to upload uh, a higher resolution photo or not higher, but a correct resolution photo to Instagram to kind of circumvent the compression that they do. If you're not noticing an issue with the compression and your photos are looking the way you want them to look, if they're mm -hmm. looking the way they should look on Instagram, like the same that they look on your phone or your computer, they look the exact same way on Instagram, which mine personally do. And I upload full resolution files all the time. Yeah. I think so much of it has to do with just having a, a, a well taken photo that has an appropriate level of sharpening applied, not too little, but mm -hmm. not too much. Yeah. Um, will will go a long way towards making your life pretty simple mm -hmm. with the Instagram compression algorithm. Yeah. I struggle with the, the stories. I've, I'll put a picture in there and it's like, oh, crap, uh, it yeah. looks terrible. Instagram yeah, stories that's, actually, are the worst. that's actually a really, really good point that I hadn't thought thought of. But if you add any of the graphics over top of a photo, okay. it down reses the photo massively. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. I didn't if, know that. If you just upload a photo with absolutely mm -hmm. nothing on it, or if you just overlay text on it, it will upload at a good resolution okay. most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> most of the time. But if you add any level of like a uh, GIF or GIF or whatever you're supposed to say, yeah. I still don't know. But um, <laughs> if you put any kind of graphic over the top of yeah. it, it, it distorts it, it or something. Oh, okay. it's, it's awful. They just destroy photos. Maybe it's my problem. So no funness. No funness. Just, just straightforward. Yeah. Here's the photo. You know what I've done in the past is I because I want people to see the photo as I intended it to be presented. Yeah. So I'll like post that in a story and then like I'll do a next story with the graphic over top of it okay. and just let it destroy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good question though. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's pretty much the basics of getting better photos. Um, there are a lot of products that can be helpful for you. Like we've mentioned uh, diffusion material that you can get pretty cheap or a, like a five in one reflector that you can use the diffusion part of that to get some better photos. And you can go all the way up to like a full blown, uh, video light setup. Um, I will say a lot of people have flashes kicking around. If they've bought a camera, a lot come with flashes. You can use uh, flash or strobes to get some lighting. You can light a watch with a strobe or with a flash, but much like a digital SLR, you're not going to see the results that you're working with until you've taken the photo. So a mirrorless camera and a continuous light source like a video light are going to help you a lot. And, you know, I use a, a light called a Pixel LED, which they're about 400 bucks or so US that anybody could go buy on Amazon. Um, you can spend double or triple that on video lights and modifiers and all kinds of stuff. You can also just, like I said, use a simple desk lamp um, with a, a 100 watt daylight balance bulb can go a long way if you just prop a piece of diffusion between it and the watch you're shooting. Um, but we will, we being Catlin, will uh, in the show notes um, put some of the links to some of the things that we've talked about in the show, like the diffusion material and the reflector. We'll also put in some links to, you know, higher end lighting setups. And there is a lot of mid range um, that you can do for 
maybe not five hundred or a thousand dollars, but you know you could spend fifty bucks or so, and you can get a lighting setup with a soft box and a plug-in bulb. That mm -hmm. it's essentially a glorified desk lamp, but yeah. it's designed specifically for photography. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff out there on the market. And if you're going really budget with it, it's all about the same. It's all going to work relatively similarly and just buy what your budget, you know, can accommodate buy what fits, what you're comfortable with spending and then just experiment and have fun with it. Um, so much of this hobby is experimentation and and like i said I, i've been shooting for quite a while and i still learn new stuff every time i shoot and that's part of the part of the fun of it yeah and yeah. and again don't hesitate to reach out to people who take photos that for you enjoy sure. yeah and if, as long as they're you know cool people they'll they'll be happy to talk to you about it yeah I think that's the joy in it is you, you, there's resources. You have people that you can talk to. You can see people on your Instagram who take better pictures or, or pictures that you like better. And you can ask those people. You can also YouTube and yeah, videos YouTube on YouTube cameras friend, and yeah, everything else. Too. Yeah. YouTube has been like life a little bit. Um, if you want to how learn to, things. Yeah. If you want to know how to take better photos, just go to YouTube. Um, video guys are really good at this. They, there's a lot of videos out there on how to shoot really good B roll and just search how to shoot better B-roll and just take everything that they talk about and apply it to photography. Yeah. And you will learn a ton for like a couple of hours of time invested in YouTube. Yeah. Very cool. Well, right. I think that wraps it up. I hope everybody enjoyed this in-depth dive into photography. Yeah. I feel like so much of it is still up <laughs> in my head, but oh, it's fine. It. It's, it's such fine. a deep topic, but I hope, it that, really is. I hope it was helpful to people. For and sure. and if, if I said anything in here that is, um, a little over anybody's head or, or something didn't make sense and you want some clarification, my DMs are always open at stuff and watches. Um, you know, just, just hit me up. I'm happy to help however I can. I want as many people enjoying photography and watches as possibly can be because yeah. selfishly, that's just more content for me to look at <laughs> and more people for me to interact with. And I yeah. love it. So perfect. Uh, real quick question before we head out here. Is there any Instagram profiles that you, um, really like or are they your favorites as far as photography goes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, at Ty Alexander, I think it's at Ty Alexander Photography. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he does this for a living. Uh, I would not want to do this for a living. I would, yeah. I'd get way too burnt out. Um, but he d does some pretty next level stuff. Um, friend of the show, Max at the Black Dial, isn't yeah. shooting mm -hmm. as much anymore as he used to. Um, but I actually found him because he had a studio set up of a light shining through an Ikea hamper oh, yeah. as his diffusion for his photos. And I found his account through that and he's got some really great photography and some great watches too. Yeah. Um, I really like him a lot. Um, M C H U W I S Michael Chu. Why you, uh, watch idiot savant okay. is what that's short for. Um, he has some amazing watches and I really like his photography. He's got some, he just posted uh, something very recently that he didn't have his typical setup for photos. And so he laid out, he opened up his laptop and left the screen at a 45 degree angle and pulled up a YouTube video of just a blank white screen. And he turned the brightness all the way up. And then he put his watch on the keyboard on top of a, a, a cloth. And then that was his light for a shot that he took. That was an, an excellent shot of a yeah. movement of a watch. And it's like just something as small and ingenuitive as that. Yeah. Like once you start to recognize light, you can start to make light mm -hmm. and adapt light to Plenty your advantage. Yeah. Um, he's got some really cool stuff and some cool watches. I just highly recommend following mm -hmm. him. I mean, there's so many people. Yeah. Evan, you're at your terrific one. Oh, yeah. yeah. His yeah. his wrist shots are excellent. Mm -hmm. His watches are excellent. Uh, really cool dude. Um, I mean, there's, oh man, I, I could go, go on. <laughs> I could go on and on and on and I would leave out so many people. Yeah. Um, and I would, there's just so many people. If you just follow, if you, if you see one person, mm -hmm. what a lot of people will do is tag other people in their photos. Yeah. And I don't do that as much as I should. It's, it's like more steps <laughs> yeah. and I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, like check the comments. Mm -hmm. There's, there's so many people who are yeah. good. Some of the OGs are like B Harmon. I think it's B Harmon 47. Oh yeah. He's um, too. At Lactard Josh. 
there's just there's a lot of guys out there who do some really really good work. Huh? Very cool. All right, awesome. guys and girls. Yeah. <laughs> oh, speaking of girls, um, I know she shoots actually with a Leica, but it's uh, pocket trinkets. I don't know. If oh you know. yeah, really good. Yes, I think amazing. she. I want to say it's like a Leica Q two maybe i'm not mm -hmm. not positive on that we'll tag her yeah, yeah. phenomenal yeah. photos yeah when yeah. i said there was very few leicas that work for watch photos the yeah. q system is one of the ones that do yeah. i think probably maybe the best watch photographer on instagram is alice oh, at yeah. curious horology so she shoots good. all the watch mm -hmm. gecko stuff and yeah. just her personal stuff is off amazing. the charts good it's amazing like she is so so good so um and shout out to fellow hotix uh, member Bark and Jack, Bark and Jack, uh, Adrian. Adrian. His his watch stuff yeah. has come up, yeah, big time. Um, his I mean his video quality is exceptionally good, uh, but his photography is he already had a really good eye and like some of his non watch stuff I'm actually a really big fan of. Oh yeah, but so. his his watch stuff has leaps and bounds it was already good and yeah. it's become leaps and bounds better yeah so much respect to adrian for for his stuff you were too say rick there for a second i was like oh. <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> we can give him a hard time yeah <laughs> Uh, but he's trying. He's yeah. trying. He is. His his recent picture uh, while he was skiing, skiing was not as bad. <laughs> not as bad. Not as bad. Ricky's pretty handy with the camera. Yeah, Ricky's Ricky is. Good. Yeah. Rick is not. I mean, somebody <laughs> had to carry the team there. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but yeah, so check out everything on our website. Uh, on the show notes, www.tenandtwo.com. It will have links to everything It'll that Josh is talking about. It'll, It'll be, be a big one. It'll be full. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a lot to do this weekend. <laughs> um, show notes will be there uh, obviously follow us on Instagram Facebook at 10 and 2 media make sure you're following Josh because he's pretty cool uh, at stuff and watches he's not too bad um, follow our little group uh, at we are hot X on Instagram at some point maybe we'll get together and do a podcast I don't think it's happening and y'all can blame Rick for that by the way blow up his DMs because he's the one with the difficult schedule and that is all that's it all right thanks guys Thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.